welcome to CG. Uh, before I get to the main act, as it were, speaking of welcome to CG, uh, many of you who came in might have seen the buzz uh, in our old building, the old Seagram building next door, and that's because tonight is when Shopify officially moves into that building and they're having their housewarming party. And I simply wanted to sort of welcome them to, to, the, to the largest of uh, community life and campus life here. Looking forward to having them as our friends and neighbors and very much looking forward to uh, the, the very many things that, that, that they will bring to us and stay tuned uh, for that one as well. Now, um, given what Jim Stanford does and stands for, I found it quite surprising when we met earlier today that he hasn't been here before, that it took us this long to connect and bring him. But Jim, welcome uh, to, uh, to CG. Um, Jim, in many ways, doesn't need an introduction to many of you because we know him as the voice of the labor economist, as it were, as he, as he was often portrayed on, uh, on television and in the media. And in fact, Jim is one of Canada's best known economic commentators. Uh, he served for many years as the economist and director of policy for UNIFOR, which is Canada's largest private sector union, formerly known as the Canadian Auto Workers Union. He still advises the union, but now calls uh, Australia and uh, Hamilton, Ont Sydney, Australia, and Hamilton, Ontario home. At McMaster, he is the Harold Innes Industry Professor in Economics at Mac. Uh, and he still writes regular columns, as you all would know, for the Globe and Mail, and is a founding member of CBC Television's Bottom Line Economics Panel. He's the one to the far left on the panel. Um, given his background, I guess the topic of his talk, uh, Beggar Thy Neighbor, Hurdles of International Trade Governance, should come as no surprise. And perhaps Jim will even give, a, give us a bit of a lesson in uh, the great work of Harold Innes. I should also say that there's a second edition out. Uh, the first one came out about eight years ago, I'm guessing, Jim, of his book, Economics for Everyone, A Short Guide to the Economics of Capitalism. There's a second edition out, and there will be copies for sale and signature, uh, and perhaps even a photograph at the end of this uh, lecture. So for those of you interested, by all means, join us for that as well. Um, the format is the usual one. Jim will speak with us. He will take his own questions from you in the audience and for those of you watching on the web. And we will then wind up with a few words from my colleague who heads CG's uh, economics program, Domenico Lombardi. So thank you again. And Jim, welcome to CG. All right, thank you so much, uh, Rowanton. Thanks uh, all of you for coming out on such a glorious late summer evening to listen to an economist. They say an economist is someone who's good with numbers and didn't have the personality to become an accountant. <laughs> so with that forewarning, if any of you want to leave and go to the patio across the street and uh, have a drink, I won't be at all uh, offended. But uh, I'm really excited uh, to come to CG for the first time. And uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a fabulous building, a wonderful uh, theater, and a tremendous uh, group of people who are really helping to uh, stir the pot uh, in the policy world, including uh, on international economic policy, which is what we're talking about uh, tonight. So I'm very grateful for the invitation uh, to join you, and thank you. Uh, for coming along uh, tonight. I have, of course, uh, traveled to, uh, to Canada, or as the uh, recently departed Prime Minister of Australia called it, Canadia. <laughs> that was uh, Mr. Uh, Tony Abbott uh, who, who said that on his last visit. Uh, all the way from uh, Straya, as uh, I'm learning to pronounce the vernacular uh, down there. And it's an exciting challenge uh, for me to be based in uh, Sydney and learn about uh, Australian issues. And, Often they're shockingly uh, similar. Uh, in fact, uh, Rohanton uh, mentioned uh, uh, Harold Innes, the, the famous Canadian economic historian who my position at McMaster is named after. And there should be a, a Australian Harold Innes uh, because they have exactly uh, the same history and the same trajectory and the, both the, the benefits and the, and the downsides of uh, the resource dependence and the boom times while they last, but uh, we've been around that block a couple times in Canada and the boom times don't always last. Uh, I grew up in Alberta, uh, of course, to, in an oil family and I do remember the bumper sticker uh, in, uh, in Calgary in about, I don't know, 1986, I think, uh, 
said, please God, let there be another oil boom, and I promise not to piss it all away this time. You know? And uh, I think that bumper sticker just replays oil with coal uh, or iron ore, and that bumper sticker would be a popular uh, seller in, uh, in Australia. Um, another thing, of course, uh, that the two countries have in common was these two guys. There's uh, Mr. Abbott and uh, Mr. Harper. They were a uh, tag team for years. At, I think this was actually at a G20 meeting, if I'm not mistaken. This photo uh, where they... Was it a G20 meeting? You guys are the G20 experts. There was a meeting in India. What? It had to be. Oh, oh, it was APEC. Okay, yeah, there you go. Yeah, with shirts like that, you're right. Uh, anyways, uh, <laughs> the... It's better than the, the respective pictures they had separately, of course. The, the famous one of Mr. Abbott was him chewing a raw onion. I don't know if any of you uh, saw that up here. And, uh, of course, Mr. Harper had a few of his own. But they both, uh, both departed. They've both been replaced by, uh, by new, uh, new prime ministers. And it's a, an exciting time to be in Australia, helping to share some of the lessons that we learned uh, in Canada. Uh, Rohan, you care, very generously mentioned uh, the book that's for sale outside. I always hasten to add, I don't get a cent from the sales of these books. I did something that uh, is a crime against nature, according to neoclassical economics. I did something for love, not for money. And uh, all of the proceeds uh, from the book go to the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, which is our progressive think tank in Canada. And uh, there's a website that actually has a whole bunch of free materials. I know there's some teachers in the room, a whole bunch of uh, lecture notes and other student exercises, pedagogical materials for teaching economics, including a couple of chapters on international economics uh, from uh, a more critical perspective. And please help yourself from those materials uh, at the website, open source. And then uh, finally, there's my Twitter handle, Jimbo Stanford. So if uh, anyone's uh, on Twitter tonight, feel free to uh, let loose. And uh, we'll stay in touch that way, uh, even when I'm down in... Uh, in Straya, when I'm back in Straya, I've learned actually, if I want to tweet to my Canadian followers, I have to do it in the middle of the night <laughs> in Australia, which is regular time here. And if I want to tweet to my Australian followers, I tweet in the day there, which is the middle of the night here. So that's, uh, that's kind of handy uh, that way. So finally, uh, this is a, a sort of more formal reference for some of the material that I'm going to be covering tonight. This is a chapter that was in a book published recently by the Institute for Research on Public Policy in Montreal. Uh, about trade challenges uh, facing Canada, and some of the material that I'll be covering tonight comes from that source, if anybody wants to uh, get proper proper about it and check out the citations and, and, and all that kind of stuff, uh, please do. That's available, the whole book's available on their website uh, for free. So, we're in a time of uh, actually an unprecedented backlash against the traditional precepts of uh, globalization. So, uh, we've seen it all over uh, the world, of course. We've seen it with uh, Mr. Farage and the uh, Brexit uh, phenomena in Britain, uh, the rise of uh, kind of xenophobic, uh, very right-wing anti-globalization politi politicians like uh, Ms. Le Pen in uh, France, and uh, of course, closer to home, we have, God help us, uh, President-designate uh, tr Mr. Trump, uh, see what happens there. But uh, it is amazing how the politics of the discussions of free trade have changed in the last few years, uh, and, and there is something behind it. Uh, you obviously have politicians who are incredibly clever and effective at taking advantage of uh, a public mood, but they wouldn't be successful if there wasn't a public mood for them to take advantage of and to misdirect in, in what I believe are uh, very destructive, dangerous, xenophobic, uh, and, and, and potentially um, catastrophic uh, directions. Um, but I don't think the response to this backlash is to pretend that the problem doesn't exist or that people are somehow misguided into thinking that uh, globalization is bad when in fact anyone who's taken Economics 101 at college knows that globalization is perfect, good, and mutually beneficial all of the time. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that does seem to be kind of the official response of the nabobs, if you like, in charge of the global economy uh, to this moment of challenge and danger is to say, well, we must redouble our efforts, friends, uh, to illustrate and illuminate those uh, misguided uh, people out there as to why uh, free trade is actually uh, good for them, not bad for them. Uh, so a couple of examples of that response, a commentary published by a senior official at the World Bank recently um, to the effect of uh, isolationism and protectionism would break the trade-based economic engine that has delivered peace and prosperity to the world for decades. You know, uh, I mean, so all of those people who voted for the Brexit in uh, Rust Belt Britain and all the people who are voting for Trump uh, 
in Rust Belt and other impoverished parts of America just haven't figured out that they're enjoying an unprecedented period of peace and uh, prosperity. Uh, so that, that kind of I know better than you what's good for you attitude is uh, obviously as offensive as it is ineffective. Uh, Christine Lagarde on the close of the G20 meeting the other day in China uh, said something similar and we need to better identify the benefits of trade in order to respond to the easy populist backlash uh, against uh, globalization. So there isn't uh, any uh, rationale, there isn't any logic behind that backlash, it's, it's just uh, misguided somehow. Interesting, uh, as she made that statement, she used the experience of China as the case study in the benefits of globalization and free trade, uh, which was astounding uh, to me. She is an economist and she should know full well that the incredible things that have happened in China, including uh, the reduction of poverty for hundreds of millions of people, it is incredible, it has nothing to do with free trade. Uh, whatever the uh, successes uh, of that regime are, and there's a downside to it as well, but I recognize the successes. Uh, it's all about uh, planning and state regulation and intervention, uh, not about uh, free trade at all. Uh, so uh, even in their own intellectual framework, um, the, the hypocrisy is, uh, is astounding. Uh, the promise of globalization uh, has, uh, has always been extraordinary. Uh, if you liberalize international commerce, then you'll promote more trade, and the goal of more trade is somehow seen as good in and of itself. You don't have to go further than that. If you say something promotes trade, then it must be good. Um, it will force countries or encourage countries to specialize in producing the things that they do best. Um, the uh, whole idea of comparative uh, advantage. Total output of the world economy will grow because people will be more productive because they're doing what they do best. There will be no impact on employment, uh, at least uh, other than any kind of short run adjustment effects. The uh, total level of employment will remain uh, constant. Consumers will benefit because they'll have more choice and cheaper products. Uh, and you'll get gains from this whole process that will be shared uh, by all participants. This is the promise of the uh, uh, standard model of international free trade that's been posited uh, for uh, uh, over two centuries uh, now. In reality, um, the expectation is different. This would be the theme song for the, uh, the traditional view. Everyone's a winner. Everyone's a winner, baby, that's the truth. <laughs> Disco revival. White jeans, look at, look at that, eh? Our Prime Minister is wearing jeans like these these days, I'm told. Uh, there was even a photo of it in the, uh, uh, in the Australian papers uh, of him and his white jeans, go figure. Um, so, uh, you know, this idea that everyone can win and no one will lose uh, is actually very deeply embedded uh, in traditional uh, theory. In reality, of course, uh, it has been quite different. And in Canada's experience, um, we've seen some perverse outcomes. We have seen, in, as globalization was uh, intensified, we've actually seen a shift in our production activity towards non-tradable industries. Those uh, t uh, generally smaller scale, lower income, lower productivity, non-tradable service activities, uh, which um, have nothing to do with globalization. In fact, it's because they were insulated from globalization that they were able to survive and grow uh, while other industries uh, contracted. Uh, so that's uh, perverse. We've seen a shift in our resources toward lower productivity growth sectors, including those non-tradables, but even in the tradables uh, area, you've seen an emphasis uh, on non-renewable resource extraction where productivity is falling over time. That's the whole idea of a non-renewable resource. You go after the low-hanging fruit first, you tap the reserves that are most economical to uh, tap, and then the harder stuff takes more time to produce. If you're going to get oil by putting a hole in the ground and watching it all flow out, uh, that's easy. If you have to get oil by digging out mountains of sand and processing it through incredibly expensive refineries, that's hard. And productivity in the energy sector and other non-renewable extractive sectors falls over time. And that's where we've been putting more of our resources uh, to the extent that we're specializing in tradables at all. We've seen a profound deindustrialization uh, in Canada, a decline in manufacturing that is not typical of uh, advanced uh, countries. There are reasons why you might see an erosion of manufacturing as a share of GDP over time in an advanced country as you shift towards uh, services industries, but you shouldn't see an outright decline of the scale that we've experienced in Canada. Um, we've seen consistent large trade deficits and the mounting of international debt uh, that is clearly associated with reductions in our GDP and employment levels. The fact that 
billions, tens of billions of dollars uh, are leaving the country through those trade deficits, uh, not being spent on Canadian-made products has contributed to the uh, weakness of Canada's macroeconomic uh, performance over the last few years and our labour market uh, performance. Uh, and you've seen the financial uh, instability dimension of it uh, in terms of exchange rates that shoot up and, and collapse uh, and the uh, trickle through uh, impacts of um, all of the uncertainty in our financial system. So this is what globalization is, 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 is uh, wreaking, if you like, uh, in Canada and uh, the experience in other countries uh, around the world, not all, but in many other countries has been, um, uh, if anything, more uh, more painful than it has been uh, in Canada. So this is a reality that's quite different than the theory that has been posited. Now I want to hasten uh, to add, to you know, put your fears at, at rest, I am not here today to say that we should follow a model of international engagement similar to that of North Korea, okay? I am uh, not advocating that the answer is to withdraw from the world community and put up walls. That is, strange enough, in all honesty, what I'm accused of often. When you raise questions about free trade, they say, well, then you must be uh, in favor of no trade, uh, which isn't remotely the case. In fact, I will argue tonight that my vision of how to promote trade uh, is actually going to be more effective, and you'll get more trade and more better trade uh, under my approach than uh, under others. And this idea that you're somehow isolationist by questioning the particular nature of governance of international economic activity today um, is, is quite, uh, I think, uh, unfair. So I'm not advocating autarky. I accept that trade and foreign investment and the global exchange of ideas is essential to our uh, prosperity, to how we learn uh, about things, to how we meet people, uh, to how we build a community in this, in this globe, which we better well learn how to do quickly, uh, or our problems are going get, to uh, get much, much worse. That isn't isolationist at all. Economically, I recognize that the phenomenon of export-led growth, where exports can be an engine, uh, an engine that leads other sectors along in a, in a rather vibrant and self-sustaining path of expansion and job creation, uh, can absolutely happen uh, and there are many examples from you know China recently, South Korea, Germany, uh, some of the other European countries, uh, Latin American countries uh, before the current downturn, many examples uh, around us of how uh, an economy can be led by exports but that's very different than a free trade vision which says the gains from trade come from something else, not from an engine uh, that's creating new jobs where jobs didn't exist before. That isn't the free trade uh, model at all. Uh, the free trade model is really just about mutual specialization of jobs that already uh, existed. I accept that mutual specialization can uh, be beneficial, uh, if you're, particularly if you're getting a share of specialization in the types of jobs and industries that are especially valuable, but it can also lead to losses if you get pushed through specialization uh, into other industries. It d delivers bigger losses if your specialization ends up being doing nothing at all, which is what happens when people are unemployed as a result of uh, a big shift in uh, trade balances uh, and competitiveness against your uh, economy. The main point that I, that I want to make is that those problems can exist. They're assumed away by theorists uh, in the mainstream international economics tradition, but they can exist in the real world. And if we want to build a global economic governance system that is more effective than the one that we've got today, we have to start by recognizing those problems uh, that can exist, that there are winners and losers in global competition. It isn't uh, everyone's a winner, that's the truth type of scenario. Uh, in fact, it's um, uh, a harsher, um, uh, zero sum at times uh, competition. And we have to be cognizant of those economic risks, we have to be cognizant of the potential downsides of globalization, and then develop structures that can address and ameliorate and manage those downsides. Uh, and that way we can try to actually make sure that the gains from trade are shared in the way that the traditional models assume uh, that they will. Otherwise, you will have a beggar thy neighbor structure where, where one industry, one sector, one country is going to gain, but at someone else's expense. Um, Holland and Germany and South Korea and China can benefit hugely from running consistent current account surpluses, that is selling more to the rest of the world than they buy from them, equal to 5% or more of their GDP year after year after year. But that model cannot be replicated for everyone because by definition, someone's current account surplus has to be someone else's current account deficit 
unless we get to a position where we're exporting to Mars, okay? Uh, so uh, that's the, the mathematical reality of it. And the damage of those deficits, of those imbalances, the damage that comes from an unfavorable specialization uh, trajectory, and the damage that comes from what countries end up doing to limit balance of payments deficits in the absence of some kind of international system, that is, they end up deflating their own economies to limit demand, to limit the uh, excess uh, of imports that are coming into those economies. That deflationary bias is one of the reasons why the global economy is in the state that it's in, which is growth that disappoints year after year after year after year. I think that a better approach would be for us to abandon the false assumptions, and I'll detail what some of those assumptions are that are built into uh, current trade theory, uh, the assumptions that would lead you to conclude that we shouldn't worry about this because everyone uh, is going to benefit, be realistic about those downsides, uh, and then implement policies and governance structures that can address the downsides and try to make sure that the gains uh, are shared. So the tradition of comparative advantage thinking, of course, goes back to David Ricardo. So we've gone uh, back uh, over, 200, uh, over 200 years now, uh, who intervened in a famous debate in Britain about the uh, Corn Laws, which in essence was a tariff in Britain on imported uh, wheat and other grains. And uh, he was of the view that those tariffs should be eliminated. Now, he wasn't really motivated by a pure sort of intellectual uh, pursuit at the time. Like the other classical economists, his, uh, his peers in that uh, school of thought, he was motivated by rather a, a, political, uh, a political goal. He uh, was very um, enamored of the productive, innovative, thrifty role played by this new class of industrial capitalists that had emerged in, in Britain and uh, a few other countries uh, over the previous decades. Um, he saw them as the force of dynamism and innovation and growth in the economy, unlike the previous elite of society, which was the landed gentry, who in their view did nothing other than, you know, live off the surplus that they uh, collected semi-forcibly uh, from those who produced the surplus in the, in, the, in the rural areas, and consumed it. Capitalists, on the other hand, collected a surplus, but they reinvested it. Uh, as the engine of growth. So he was absolutely motivated by a desire to shift money away from the landlords towards the capitalists. And that uh, political mandate or motivation led him to develop the theory of comparative advantage where he argued that reducing <coughs> the tariffs on imported foods, foodstuffs, the immediate impact would be precisely to redistribute income from the landed gentry who collected extra rents because they were protected from competition uh, by the tariffs against imported food, shift that wealth from them to the capitalists who now would be able to pay less in wages because the cost of food to feed their workers just enough to keep their workers alive to come back the next day, those costs uh, would be lower as a result of trade liberalization. And so he developed an entire theory um, to explain why this would benefit the country as a whole um, in a way to put in context or, or, or perhaps uh, disguise his political agenda, which was do something that helps the capitalists and hurts uh, the landlords. Well, this idea of promoting free trade because it means that the foodstuffs that workers need to survive will be cheaper and therefore it's good uh, for the people who employ them, that idea is alive and well today. And uh, by the way, it's just down the street, okay? That's exactly what you see with the sort of Walmart uh, world and the dollar store economy, the fact that free trade allows uh, unfettered imports of uh, generally low cost and often low quality consumer goods uh, is a way to help keep the system going in an era where wage increases are, uh, are slim to none, okay, uh, but a way to kind of uh, help working people survive in that type of environment and say, well, you can always get stuff really cheap. Uh, down, uh, down at Walmart. So, in a way, um, Ricardo's idea, of course, is, uh, is still with us, not just the technical theory of mutually beneficial trade, but also the political context uh, in which that discussion happens. Well, uh, comparative advantage theory, of course, has evolved a lot since David Ricardo um, uh, brought it in. It, under, it evolved along with the parallel theory of value and distribution. Um, which became known as neoclassical uh, economics uh, today. Uh, the idea of a Valrasian general equilibrium where uh, factor endowments and uh, direct and indirect exchange uh, ensures that all productive resources are utilized in such a way as to maximize the potential consumer welfare uh, from, from that. And uh, in the 
international trade application of neoclassical theory, uh, what was often called heckscher olin uh, theory. They came to explain international trade on the basis of the different factor endowments that different countries had. The whole general equilibrium theory is based on an initial endowment, which they don't try to explain. They take it as uh, arbitrarily given. And if you apply that same thinking to the international sphere, then you have countries that just happen to have more labor, less labor, more capital, less capital. Uh, as Paul Samuelson uh, famously put it, he said, countries with tropical climates tend to specialize in the export of tropical fruits and vegetables. Uh, that's why you get a PhD in economics, by the way, is so that you can, <laughs> you can say uh, profound, uh, profound things like that. Now, the important thing that was inherited from Ricardo's vision into the neoclassical version of comparative advantage theory uh, is the um, uh, claim that no country can be generally undercut by imports from another country that are seen to be more competitive than what the, what the initial home country uh, produces. And this is the uh, counterintuitive elegance uh, of the whole uh, comparative advantage model that uh, you may face a trading partner which seems to be more competitive in absolute terms than you are at doing everything but uh, you can still specialize in what you do relatively most efficiently, even if it's less efficient than what the other person is doing, because you'll specialize in what you do relatively most efficiently, and they'll specialize in those industries that they're super efficient at. And you can show mathematically that the total amount of output will increase in that situation, uh, and you should be able to share the gains between both of the countries. So uh, in that world, uh, the whole idea of competitiveness isn't even a relevant concept. And that's kind of surprising, because if you read the newspapers and listen to politicians, they're constantly going on about how Canada has to become more competitive by cutting our taxes and by cutting wages and doing other things to make Canada more attractive as a, uh, a location for mobile uh, industries. Uh, yet in the pure theory that our economy is supposedly uh, based on, competitiveness in a general sense is not a relevant concept at all. Every country is competitive by definition uh, in this uh, approach. So. The famous example, of course, is trading uh, textiles made in Britain for wine made in Portugal, or port uh, uh, fermented in Portugal. This was the original example that Ricardo used to show that even if the Portuguese did both things better, uh, the UK would still be better to unilaterally liberalize its trade, um, and in particular those imports of food uh, that he was uh, interested in. So that vision of trade as being, you know, I'll produce one thing, you'll produce something else and, and, and our boats will cross and we'll both be better off. The textiles for the port vision is still how economics is uh, taught today. But in fact, modern free trade agreements, for the most part, have nothing to do with textiles and port and other menial forms of international trade. If you go to any of the trade agreements that have been signed, add up the number of pages that describe the elimination of tariffs on actual uh, flows uh, of uh, products and, you know, you've got uh, under 10% of the total document. All the rest of the document is about all kinds of other things, uh, such as uh, patent laws uh, around pharmaceutical uh, uh, products, uh, for example. Uh, interestingly enough, free trade agreements are aimed at strengthening patent laws and lengthening periods of uh, patent protection, which is kind of ironic, isn't it? Because that's exactly the opposite of free trade. If you were truly interested in free trade, you would take away the patent and say, let's have competition uh, in producing that. So. Uh, of course, some of the provisions around services industries trade in free trade agreements are all about enforcing a certain vision of uh, deregulation on services industries uh, in the same way that they're about enforcing a certain vision of patent protection uh, on countries. Uh, or, of course, you have the, uh, the most bizarre phenomenon of all, of course, which is the investor state uh, arbitration system where you get these uh, parallel uh, kangaroo courts uh, being set up where uh, companies can uh, sue governments for anything that, um, uh, that is seen to arbitrarily affect the profitability of their investment in a foreign country, which suggests if you ever have a gripe against government, okay, don't, you know, go to the Toronto Star and get, you know, put in complaints or bother right to your cabinet minister. Form a corporation, okay, get a foreign partner because your corporation has to be foreign registered and then file an investor state complaint against the uh, government about how your uh, material prospects have been hindered by by a, a shift in, in policy. Uh, at the extreme, of course, the most dramatic events in the global economy have nothing to do with uh, even uh, services industries or patents or anything like that. They're all about the, uh, the financial uh, flows 
uh, that dominate uh, exchange markets and stock markets uh, on the basis of uh, speculation and uh, uh, an alternation between greed and fear in the minds of financial investors. So we had a situation where the uh, collapse of some mortgages in Florida led to the collapse of the uh, entire Icelandic economy. Oh, <laughs> that's me. That's not the slides. Oh, there we go. Okay. Was it me all along? No? Oh, good. Okay. Phew. Because <laughs> if it was me all along, a lot of those jokes just did not work. Okay. <laughs> all right. The Icelandic economy collapsed because the uh, Florida housing market went south. And I've often thought that if you had been visiting planet Earth from an alien uh, civilization and watched this happen, where, you know, an island in the middle of the cold North Atlantic uh, imploded because of some ho bad house sales on the other side of the planet, you'd say, there is no intelligent life on this planet. Let's go back uh, to, where, uh, to where we came from. So the uh, assumptions uh, of the theory, I think we have to uh, elucidate so that we understand exactly how far-fetched it is. An assumption of the neoclassical model of comparative advantage is that uh, output of the whole system is always constrained only by the amount of factors, the supply of factors in the whole system. So the number of workers, the amount of capital, and the other productive resources will always be fully employed thanks to the assumed working of um, effective markets. So that's a supply-constrained economy, not a demand-constrained economy, and you'll have full employment both before and after uh, the free trade agreement or the trade liberalization exercise. So in this regard, again, a politician who stands up and says this free trade agreement is going to create so many thousand jobs um, is not being consistent to their underlying principles because in the true model, you were fully employed before and you were fully employed after. All that happened is that you've become more efficient in that work by specializing in what you do relatively best. Moreover, not only are you employed, but you were paid a fair neutral wage that reflects your actual physical productivity before and after. So the idea of losing good jobs and ending up working at Tim Hortons, which is what has exactly happened in much of this part of the world uh, under globalization, can't happen because there's no such thing as a good job or a bad job. All jobs, uh, given a, a certain level of skill and productivity, are paid the same. This is important. In, bo in both versions of the model, the Ricardian version and the neoclassical version, you have to assume that capital is not mobile uh, between countries. Because if capital was mobile, then a country that had an absolute advantage in both textiles and port would become a magnet for capital that was imported from the other country to take advantage of that uh, efficiency uh, across the board. Um, and in fact, that is what happens in many cases uh, today, given capital mobility, which has been a, a key goal of the trade agreements. And a, 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 the flip side of the coin of assuming that there's no capital mobility is assuming that trade will be balanced. So anything that's imported has to be matched by something that you export, uh, because that's the only the way that you can pay for it. You can't pay for it by importing capital in the form of debt uh, to pay for an ongoing uh, deficit. Finally, the assumption is that the um, value of the trade agreement will be reflected in the value of uh, national output. In other words, we're talking about a country, and formally, in the models, this is the assumption of a representative household, whereby uh, consumer preferences and consumer choices are modeled as if the whole country was one family, okay, and we share the benefits. So <clears throat> certain parts of the economy will produce more, certain parts may produce less. On a net basis, it has to produce more because you have everyone still working and they're working more efficiently. Therefore, the family is uh, better off. So if I look at these assumptions, this is very ironic for me as someone who comes from the left uh, of the spectrum. Okay, this is a model designed to explain and rationalize a sort of extreme pro-capitalist model of how the international economy should be run. Yet the starting assumptions of this model look a lot like a, a vision of utopian socialism, okay? You've got full employment, everyone's guaranteed a job, everyone's paid fairly and equally. Capital has to stay in Canada, it can't go to Mexico, it has to be invested here. We have to export as much as we import. We can't have big trade deficits like the ones that we experience. And what's more, we're gonna share equally everything that's produced in society within this representative household. So I say, give me those assumptions, and I'm all for the trade agreement, okay, if that's uh, actually how it uh, unfolded. Um, the implications of the theory, as I mentioned, competitiveness is not an issue. Every nation is competitive by definition. Comparative advantage in general is just something that's given, okay? Tropical countries are just naturally good at producing tropical fruits and vegetables. 
Energy-rich countries are just naturally good at digging energy out of the ground and selling it to other people. And uh, some countries are especially good at producing technology-intensive, high-value products that they sell uh, to the rest of the world and make a killing. Uh, so, of course, there's nothing static about uh, comparative advantage and how it actually uh, is experienced. There, actually, I, even the idea of comparative advantage doesn't make sense in a world where you have chronic unemployment and where competitiveness uh, does matter. But even where you are good, uh, at competing as a country, that changes over time based on how the economy evolves, based on the advantage that you create, not that you were given, but the advantage that you create through a winner-loser competitive battle uh, to uh, innovate products, to produce them uh, at effective uh, appealing prices, and to sell them uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, trade liberalization will enhance total global output and therefore should uh, uh, create the possibility for everyone uh, to be better off. And if you oppose this, it's either that you're illiterate, okay, and again, Mr. PhD in economics, and I've been accused of just not understanding it uh, dozens of times uh, as I've debated this over the years, or you know full well what you're doing, you're protecting someone's vested interest in the current regime and you don't want to have your uh, privilege competed away uh, by a trade agreement. The policy strategy that comes out of it is exactly the policy strategy that we've been following in Canada and internationally for uh, the last uh, 30 years. Liberalization will automatically uh, benefit. The key is to get the liberalization. You don't have to worry about managing things afterwards, just get that uh, trade agreement. You can pursue it wherever you can, bilateral agreements, multilateral agreements like the CETA or uh, the TPP or uh, at the WTO. And part of the policy strategy has been when you run up against a brick wall for a while in one of those avenues, well then go and try something else. And we've seen that uh, cadence alternating between multilateral and bilateral uh, agreements. At most, you can acknowledge there might be transitional problems of adjustment. If the economy is going to specialize in another industry, then you're going to have to move people over to work in that industry. And that's where you get the emphasis on retraining and mobility assistment for displaced uh, workers that is usually talked about but never done, okay, certainly in the Canadian experience, other than the dairy farmers and the TPP. That was the first time I saw the government put serious money on the table around a transition assistance for a trade-affected industry, and that, of course, had everything to do with which ridings the dairy farmers live in, okay, in the lead-up to an election, and uh, they lost the election anyway. So. Um, uh, other than that, they talk about transition assistance a lot, don't deliver it, but even if they did deliver it, it wouldn't do the trick because the sorts of problems I'm talking about are not transition problems. They're not short-run adjustment problems. They are the loss, in a permanent sense, of economic opportunity that comes because you have uh, uh, integrated your economy uh, in a situation where across the board, or at least across much of the board, you're not uh, competitive enough to maintain your share of the jobs and investment uh, that are happening. And then the policy strategy is to just kind of steamroller it through. You put the uh, big trade announcement out there, then you enlist uh, all of the work of uh, uh, your instruments of advertising and communications and lobbying, and you enlist a whole bunch of economists to uh, prepare economic models uh, to show the benefits of this, and then just as uh, Christine Lagarde said the other day, let's make sure that the populists out there uh, can understand why what we're doing is good for them. Uh, so here's one example. This is funny. I just have to share a little bit of uh, Australia uh, with you on this one. We just had an election down in uh, Australia, and the government, which was uh, just re-elected by one seat, it's a coalition government between the Liberals and the National Party, a key part of their plank, uh, of the, a key plank in their platform was a pledge to sign more export trade agreements, okay? This is the, the terminology in their platform, because they've just signed free trade agreements with China, Korea, and Japan, and they pledged that we'll get the economy going. I know the economy is not doing well in Australia, but we'll get it going by doing even more export trade agreements, which was interesting to me, because they're not calling it free trade agreements anymore. They must have sniffed the same sort of populist backlash that we've been talking about. But to call it an export trade agreement instead of a free trade agreement is hilarious because, of course, there is another side to the trade agreements. There's also an import side to the trade agreements. And in Australia's case, like Canada's, the free trade agreements have led to far stronger growth in imports than uh, in exports. Uh, 
The other thing I loved was how they used this picture, which to me looks like a show from, a, a picture from The Bachelor, you know, the Australian version of The Bachelor. I mean, look at this hunky guy that they've got there. And uh, there actually is a, a, a marriage reality show in Australia called, called Farmer Needs a Wife, believe it or not. <laughs> Farmer Needs a Wife, okay, where they get some guy who honestly looks like this. It might even be from the show, I'm not sure, with his uh, avocados there. The worst manifestation of this uh, very unreal way of thinking about trade is in the form of these computable general equilibrium models. You can hardly, hardly say that. Try saying this three times in a row after you've had a drink. Computable e general equilibrium models, computable general equilibrium models, computable general equilibrium models. These get all kinds of press coverage and all kinds of attention and the uh, politicians hold up the study and, and, and slap it down on the table uh, with great authority. A computable general equilibrium model, I, I did one for my PhD, so I, I sort of know a little bit about them, is simply a numerical simulation model of the Valrasian general equilibrium system that underpins that whole uh, vision of trade. And what they do is they specify an equation with real numbers for each relationship that is modeled uh, within that system. The numbers attached don't necessarily have any bearing on reality. It's not even, it's, it's even one step more surreal than econometrics, which is using statistics to analyze real world empirical data. In a CGE model, they just pick numbers out of the air that happen to sort of mimic what you see from the real economy. Then you impose the same solutions on the model as you, uh, as you needed in the theory about full employment, uh, fair pricing for all factors of production, the representative household, balanced trade, and so on. And then you run the model to show what the alleged gains from free trade are going to be. So every time you hear, and you've seen it with the CETA, for example, and we will see it with the TPP uh, when it comes to the debate over it, there'll be economists standing up and saying, this is going to increase our GDP by $12.8 billion, uh, or some such number. And the number, uh, the, the amount of that gain is small in the big picture. Even if it was true, it wouldn't be very impressive. Okay, but once you understand what it is, you realize this isn't actual observation or empirical research on the economy. This is a giant game of Sim City, uh, is what these models are, where you build an interesting imaginary world. And in fact, honestly, it is fun. I have to tell you, I loved doing the CGE model and getting it to solve. And, and you know, maybe I would have had another career if I'd have gone into uh, gamer programming after that experience. I don't know. Uh, but it has nothing to do with reality, and there's no reason that if you accept, if you don't accept those starting assumptions, and you shouldn't, then you shouldn't believe the number that comes out the other end. In the real world, there are winners and losers from free trade and trade liberalization, just as there are in any other form of competition. Uh, in the real economy, how much you produce and how many jobs there are depends on how much demand there is for the stuff that you're producing. In a neoclassical system, that's not a problem because you assume that factor market adjustments are going to ensure that everyone's fully employed at the end of the day. In the real world, that isn't the case. Unemployment is a normal feature of the economy. So now you have to consider how is a new policy, whether it was a trade policy or any other policy, going to affect the level of demand pressure on the economy and the level of support for jobs and investment uh, in that economy. And in that type of a world, then whether you're absolutely competitive in a healthy range of industries, you won't be in every industry, of course, no country can do everything competitively, but absolutely competitive, not relatively competitive, absolutely competitive in a healthy range of industries is essential if, in the context of international liberalization, you now have to produce your goods and services in a competitive uh, situation uh, relative to those produced in other jurisdictions. So if your wages uh, are high, or your taxes are high, or your productivity is low, or your innovation performance is relatively poor, that's an important one for Canada, then your products are not going to be as appealing as those from other places, and you will lose work because of the uh, enhancement of competition that comes from uh, trade liberalization. Uh, so the question you have to ask is not, will liberalization promote more trade, and therefore you assume that it's going to be uh, beneficial, but Will it produce more demand for our products or less demand for our products? We shouldn't be religious about a trade agreement, either good or bad. We should do a case-by-case -case empirical study of the range of industries, add up the ones where we think we can win new business because of the trade agreement, but dis subtract the ones where we think we're going to lose business because our products are not going to sell as well as they used to because they're now up against uh, uh, foreign competition that's more intense. 
We always do the former. Every time a trade agreement is up for grabs, there's a whole lineup of industries that go down to Ottawa and say, these are the new markets we're going to get. I think this is a great idea. But no one ever counts up the losses, probably because they're unduly influenced by an economic outlook, which assumes the losses don't exist uh, in the first place. So you have to ask, are we going to get more exports or more imports? You can't assume that they're going to be the same. And you have to ask, are we going to get more investment coming into Canada than is leaving Canada? And you can't assume that those will be the same uh, either. So on, uh, on page 306 of Economics for Everyone, the book which is conveniently for sale outside in the lobby after this event, which I don't make a cent from, okay, uh, there's a list of six ways that free trade can actually hurt an economy uh, in a rigorous economic analysis um, rather than the assumed mutual benefit. One of them is uh, unemployment that exists. If you're importing more than you're exporting, then the demand for uh, your country's products, goods and services is lower than it could be, and, uh, and, and a shift in that frontier will um, hurt employment. Capital outflow, as I mentioned, if more investment ends up going to other jurisdictions, then coming to your jurisdiction, then um, you're going to be in trouble. And this is, uh, um, uh, as, as was mentioned, as Rohan mentioned at the beginning, I'm still advising Uniform. I'm actually down at the Sheraton Centre Hotel in Toronto this week with the auto negotiations, and that's exactly what we're confronting. Uh, every one of those companies is hammering us on the head, saying, I can do this in Mexico for so cheap. Why should I put any plant in Canada? And we have to swim against that tide and try to convince them that Canada still makes sense. And in some ways it does, but uh, we've been fighting a, a, an uphill battle on that ever since NAFTA was implemented. And, ec and automotive products, by the way, is Canada's biggest export industry. So if you were going to have a winner under NAFTA, it should have been this industry, but it's been uh, fighting for its life uh, ever since. You can have a situation where even the transition costs uh, of moving everything from one industry to another are big enough to outweigh the uh, gains in efficiency that come from that move. This is an important one. You can have a situation where international market forces are pushing you in a certain direction that might not be the direction that makes sense in the long run. They're pushing you to specialize in an industry that isn't the best industry to be in. And in my judgment, extraction of non-renewable resources is one of those industries because productivity falls in those industries over time, plus they run out, that's the definition of non-renewable, plus Nowadays, we've got uh, immense environmental issues uh, related to them uh, as compared to specializing in the production of other things like sophisticated uh, machinery or high value uh, technical services uh, or, or so on. Uh, a related problem is you can experience declining terms of trade where you're producing more, okay, but you're getting less for it because the price of what you're producing is falling, perhaps because you're producing so much of it, okay? You're shooting yourself in, the, in your own foot for that reason. We experienced that in Canada where we were s pumping so much unupgraded heavy oil into the Midwest US market that we were depressing the price for our own product, okay? So it doesn't take too much brain power to figure out that this is a self-inflicted injury, um, but uh, we continued to do it because of the way that we've organized our, uh, our oil industry. Same is true in Australia today. Australia's real exports are growing so in a real GDP framework, it looks like Australia is doing well on exports, but the value of exports is falling faster. So the total revenue from exports is shrinking. Uh, that's an, another, uh, another example. Finally, you have the uh, distributional impacts arising from the fact that we are not living in one big happy family uh, in Canada and we don't share everything uh, equally. So you can have winners and losers within uh, an economy. So uh, in... Uh, a more realistic economic understanding, we have to contemplate the possibility that trade liberalization can hurt us as well as help us, and then we have to be cognizant of that uh, in our policy intervention. So just a little bit of empirical uh, data here, folks. I, I haven't put up a single chart or graph uh, or a second derivative yet in this entire presentation, and if I'm going to keep my credentials as an economist, especially since I'm speaking against free trade, okay, I'd better put up a, a, a little bit of, uh, of data. Is free trade creating trade? Or is trade liberalization that we followed in the last quarter century creating trade? Here is Canada's exports of goods and services as a share of our GDP. You might be able to have said in the 90s with, uh, you know, when, the, when the, especially the Canada-US trade flows really expanded, maybe you could say that trade was being created or there might have been other factors uh, at work there. But certainly since the turn of the century, uh, Canada perversely has been de-globalizing. 
okay, in, in this measure, uh, 15 percentage points of GDP have been shifted from our exports into other industries, um, including those no low productivity non-tradables that I talked about. So the idea that this path is generating new trade opportunities uh, is thrown into question. Same goes if you decompose our trade according to who we're trading with. Okay, so this shows since the turn of the century uh, how fast our exports have grown with different trading partners and how fast our imports have grown from different trading partners for all products and then for manufactured goods uh, in particular on the bottom half. And the key point is to compare how our trade did with the countries we have free trade agreements with versus how our trade did with countries that we don't have free trade agreements with. So that's the, uh, the, the data right there. With free trade countries, our exports grew by 1.2% a year. With countries we didn't sign free trade agreements with, they grew almost 7% a year. So the conclusion I take about this is if you believe in trade, stop signing free trade agreements because uh, it's not hurting. On the import side, the free trade agreements clearly um, meant that the imports uh, uh, were growing faster than the exports. They were growing faster from non-free trade partners as well, but uh, the balance was in our favor with non-free trade partners uh, as opposed to a, a deficit with our free trade partners. Same is true in our, our manufactured goods. Our manufactured exports to free trade partners fell uh, since the turn of the century, and they grew by 4% a year with non-free trade countries. So the idea that you have to sign a free trade agreement in order to get trade is uh, empirically uh, false. What about the assumption of balanced trade, the idea that uh, we're going to export at least as much as we import? This shows Canada's uh, current account balance over the last uh, 35 years. And, you know, you're, you're used to having some cycles in that. You're never going to have perfectly balanced trade uh, year after year after year. But you should be in some kind of relationship uh, between the two. But look at what's happened uh, since 2008. You've had very large current account deficits year after year after year that amount to the, the accumulation of a very large amount of new foreign debt. That's how you pay for a current account deficit. Um, so, uh, and, there, and it's getting worse. The latest one, the latest quarter, the second quarter of this year, the current account deficit annualized was $85 billion, which is interesting because the federal government's deficit is something like 30 or $35 billion, and you get headline after headline after headline about how bad it is that the government's in debt. Well, you know, okay, we, we can talk about that. The debt to the government is usually financed by selling bonds to another group of Canadians, so we're kind of borrowing from ourselves in that regard. With the current account deficit, we're borrowing from the rest of the world and going into debt uh, at a rather quick uh, pace. Trade is supposed to improve productivity by mutual specialization. This graph shows Canada's relative productivity in the business sector compared to the United States. So how effective are we at producing goods and services in the private sector compared to our uh, American neighbors? And through the whole post-war era, okay, when we had industrial policy and rising taxes and a growing public sector, okay, from 1945 to 1985, we were catching up to the Americans. We went from 75% of the American level to 95% of the American level by 1985. Then we said, the economy's a disaster. We appointed the McDonald Commission to go out and recommend free trade with the United States as the solution to all of our problems. And look what's happened since. We've undone all of the progress that was made catching up to the Americans in the post-war era, and then some. So we're now at a situation where uh, we are less productive in relative terms than we were in 1950, when Canada was considered a sort of a poor, somewhat backward northern, uh, uh, northern cousins uh, to the Americans. Are we specializing? Well, we are specializing, but maybe not in the right way. Uh, this breaks down our exports into two broad categories, what we call primary sectors, which is resource-dependent industries, and then value-added sectors, including automotive, aerospace, machinery, and equipment, and so on where there's more technology and uh, added value uh, in the work. And the value-added sectors did very well in the first decades of free trade, say up to about the turn of the century. They stagnated since then, at least until the last year or so, whereas the resources were kind of taking over. And there is a clear indication that Canada became more, much more dependent on resource extraction and exports. That's where free trade and comparative advantage thinking was taking us. Uh, and as I mentioned, that may not be the best uh, place. The Prime Minister, uh, of course, was in China, and everyone's uh, uh, thinking about China and how does Canada engage with China, given the importance of China in the world uh, situation. Um, and we have to engage with China. We should get uh, a, a better uh, share of business coming from China, but we're not doing it right now. 
This shows the incredible explosion of our bilateral current account deficit or trade deficit. This is just the merchandise trade deficit with China. Our services trade with China is very small and it's, and it's balanced. So this is equivalent to our uh, overall trade balance with China, which reached $45 billion uh, last year. And we've had a lot more trade with China. So if your idea is we need more trade, then we should be in great shape here. Uh, the problem is most of our trade with China is imports from China and our exports to China have been uh, very, very modest. And that deficit itself, which is over half of the total current account deficit that Canada experiences today, uh, works out to the loss of about 125,000 jobs. If that's what we were, if we were producing just that balance, that imbalance, if we were producing that amount in Canada instead of this uh, one-way flow of imports, uh, we would have uh, 125,000 more jobs. It doesn't mean unemployment is solved in Canada, but it's a significant uh, chunk of it. And uh, it clearly, whatever the rationale for how this trade uh, unfolded, it clearly didn't have to do with uh, benefits uh, to Canada. So we cannot deny that in the real world economy that we look at, uh, every individual country tries to increase its exports at the expense of others, generate uh, an export surplus, and to, when they need to, limit the flow of imports uh, by deflating uh, domestic demand. And that situation, that's a beggar thy neighbor situation where one country is trying to succeed at the expense of those that it trades with, uh, produces ongoing losses and a deflationary trend in the overall world economy. And uh, uh, I think the first step should be for us to recognize that this is a problem. We cannot go to um, uh, the Rust Belt areas of England and America and Canada and tell people everything works, stop complaining. The first step in any 12-step recovery program is to admit that you have a problem. And I think that international trade economists have to admit that we have a problem, okay? That there is a downside to trade that we have to understand where it came from and then develop the policy mechanisms to address it. Uh, and in my vision, if we're going to sustain globalization in the sense of increased global interactions, as opposed to you know, what globalization has come to symbolize uh, today, we can't just go out and sign a bunch more free trade agreements, which has been the knee-jerk uh, policy response. We need to reform the model of international trade governance, recognize that gains from trade are not automatic and neutral. We have to put limits on each country's ability to succeed at the expense of its neighbors by generating huge, huge and ongoing trade surpluses of the sort that we've seen from Germany and China uh, and South Korea and so on. We have to develop adjustment mechanisms that get to balance, not just by punishing the deficit countries, okay, and starving them of the resources that we need, they need, and deflating their economy so that they can't afford to buy anything anymore. That's one way to get rid of a trade deficit. But that imparts a deflationary tendency to the whole global system. We have to put some burden of adjustment on the surplus uh, countries uh, as well. And then we need a global macroeconomic strategy that's emphasized uh, around stimulating growth. Individual countries can do that, but their ability to do that is limited by the leakages that uh, result in a, in a globalized uh, network. Uh, so we need some kind of mechanisms at the international level to sustain overall demand and purchasing power. This is exactly where Keynes was headed when they first developed the post-war international economic infrastructure at the Bretton Woods uh, uh, meetings. Keynes proposed the idea of an international clearing union, which was a kind of an international trade bank uh, in a way, uh, and it was related to his sort of parallel proposals for an international central bank, um, an idea which uh, is also worth revisiting. And his vision was very interesting. Surplus countries were required to spend their surpluses. You couldn't get a trade surplus and then hoard it in the way that China has been doing or Germany has done. You had to spend it. If you had a trade surplus, it went into that bank, that international clearing union, and then the value of what your holdings were were depreciated by a certain percent each year, say 10% a year. So it was a spend it or lose it philosophy. Okay, and if you generated a trade surplus one year, you had to very quickly work to spend it to buy stuff back from the countries that you sold it to. And I think of that in the European case where within the common currency area, you had Germany running trade surpluses with Greece year after year after year after year, and then um, helping to punish Greece for their uh, so-called profligacy uh, with even more austerity so that Greece's adjustment was uh, forcibly attained through contraction rather than through some kind of balancing of the trade flow. 
Um, if you combine that vision with an expansionary macro stance uh, from, uh, from either national central banks and national institutions operating in concert or in independently, then um, uh, I think you, you would have the better shot at doing it. I would say that vision is a long shot today, you know, especially in light of uh, the failure of the attempt in the Eurozone to integrate some kind of uh, rational and effective uh, international decision making and governance capacity. Uh, I think it's, uh, it, and, and also given the dominance of that traditional free trade mode of thinking. Um, I think we should continue to debate and discuss these things internationally, but in the meantime, we should implement domestic policies that make sense, given a more hard-headed, realistic understanding of what free trade can and uh, can't do. We should recognize the flaws of just a straight-up laissez-faire approach, liberalize trade, and that alone will do the trick. We have to recognize that there's losses from trade as well as gains and be prepared to uh, minimize the losses, both with how we formulate trade policy. We shouldn't liberalize in places where we're going to lose from it. There's no point in doing that. You might as well think more strategically and try to um, develop trade flows that are going to benefit you as opposed to those that are going to hurt you. Um, and take other measures that would actually boost Canadian exports. I don't believe that our ability to export as a country is held back by a lack of free trade agreements. The reason our share of ex our exports as a share of GDP has been falling so dramatically is because we aren't producing the sorts of appealing, innovative, high-value goods and services that the rest of the world is prepared to, s to pay a premium for. And if we were doing more to develop, both from Canadian companies and from international companies that are present in Canada, to develop their capacity to produce and sell high-value stuff to the rest of the world, uh, then our trade performance would look better. And we have some, we have some successes uh, at that. Uh, in Canada. We have some experience with helping to build those industries. They're more the exception than the rule, but we should learn about uh, how we did it. If we look internationally, you can see many examples of countries that have taken a very hands-on, interventionist, strategic approach to developing uh, key industries, to promoting innovation, and then having that innovation pro projected into international markets through uh, strategic uh, trade uh, 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 policies. Instead of just leaving it up to comparative advantage and assuming that uh, it will end up in a mutual position, get in, get your hands dirty, and uh, stimulate those sectors and the exports that those sectors could uh, develop. You're using trade, but you're not using free trade agreements or that laissez-faire vision of uh, international uh, economic governance. And some of the examples that have worked uh, for Canada include the uh, auto sector, which is still our biggest uh, export. That auto industry isn't here because we had a comparative advantage in producing cars, far from it. The auto industry is here because government made a proactive effort to get it here. Same goes for our aerospace industry, which is one of the brightest uh, performing sectors in our international trade uh, portfolio uh, and other examples uh, as well. But I am cognizant of the fact that even if we were successful through our own here made in Canada strategies to develop export-oriented, uh, successful, innovative, uh, value-added industries, you've still got to have uh, your eye on what we can do globally um, to uh, help adjust uh, imbalances in a way that makes sense and doesn't uh, slow down the whole, the whole system. Uh, so that's my approach uh, to free trade. That's why I actually think I'm more in favor of trade than the free traders are. We just have to get more realistic about what free trade can and can't do and put in place the sorts of policies that can make sure that we get the more of the benefits and less of the costs. With that, I thank you very, very much for your attention and I uh, look forward to any questions and discussion that we have. Thank you. So there are a couple of microphones uh, at the front uh, on each side. If there's anyone that would like to come and uh, ask a, a question or, or intervene uh, on that presentation, please do so. And then we're also going to take some questions uh, from the, the webcast uh, of, this, uh, uh, of the whole lecture. So while I'm waiting for anyone to get to the mic, uh, uh, don't be shy. I will take the first question uh, from, the, from the online uh, system. Uh, Canadians seem quite focused on our national debt. Why aren't we talking more about our trade deficits? Well, thank you, John. Thank you for saying that, because I just said exactly the same question. <laughs> You're quite right. Our current account balance is twice as bad as our, our, our federal government's uh, deficit, and I actually think it's more of a danger because it translates into international debt, which means an ongoing obligation uh, to the rest of the world. 
um, whereas uh, government deficits, again, depending what they're used for, uh, can actually be very, very productive at uh, stimulating more activity right here in Canada. So I think we should focus more on trade deficits. We should pay probably more attention to them than we do to uh, government deficits. So thank you. Anybody else? Anyone want to be brave and uh, get to the mic? Someone here has to be in a trade union and is used to rushing to the mic <laughs> immediately on opportunity to stand up and say, I agree with the speaker entirely, but he just doesn't go far enough. That would be a, that would be a typical <laughs> union presentation. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Just because, and I am a member of a union. I'm a member of Unifor. I've known right. Jim for Thank a long you, time. Um, Dave Eels is my name. Uh, when you were talking about free trade, when we're talking about free trade, one thing that seems to always get mixed up with free trade is, free ca is the free movement of capital, and as opposed to actually just the movement of goods or, or produced goods. Um, there's been stories in the paper over the past couple of weeks. Uh, Apple's a great example. You know, they, they have all this billions and billions of dollars that apparently were made in Ireland that's an office in a broom closet with a sign above it kind of thing, where they don't actually employ anybody and don't do anything. How do we change the narrative that, you know, trade isn't the movement of just capital, as Kevin O'Leary likes to put it all the time. It really needs to be the actual manufactured goods. Second point to it is, when we're just moving goods around, and I remember the example that you gave earlier from a long time ago in, at Laurier up the street, when I was doing a first year economics course, and the only thing I remembered was the textiles for port. <laughs> everybody example. remembers textiles. Uh, yeah, for yeah, port. everybody's done that one. It's the only thing I ever remembered. And I remember somebody sitting beside me and said, you know, our professor, our instructor was talking about who was the big winner there. And the person beside me said, the shipmaker. You know, it was not really the, it was the person. And, and I thought, <laughs> you know, there's always those unintended consequences. But if I am that port maker in, in, in Britain, you know, 200 years ago, and we decide we're not doing port anymore, and all the port is going to be made in, in Portugal. Mm -hmm. Why would I not be included in part of that trade, and me as a person and a human being be allowed to move with that sort of specialization that I have? You know, is that, does that not need to come into the equation of these agreements? Should it just always be the free movement of goods and services? Shouldn't it be people as well? Mm -hmm. I just, Great. anyway. Wow, those are two uh, really, really thoughtful, really thoughtful questions. Thank you very much. You see how smart our uniform members are? Okay, every uniform member is, is as thoughtful as that. Um, so on the issue of trade versus capital, this is a, an important one because we do still insist on calling them free trade agreements, okay? Except in Australia where they're called export trade agreements, okay? Even though the actual freeing of trade in the traditional sense is a tiny piece of that uh, actual agreement. Most of the agreements are about other things, about liberalizing services, uh, enforcing certain models of deregulation, uh, patent protection and intellectual property rights that are you know, quite extensive, quite intrusive. You know, again, uh, this is a, a funny thing because we think of it as liberalizing or deregulating, but in fact it's regulating in the sense of requiring certain countries to follow and enforce, in sometimes very intrusive ways, a certain vision, a certain vision. Now, we could argue about intellectual property and how it could or could not be helpful, but you can't say this is deregulation when you're signing these uh, hundreds of pages of agreements that re compel you to regulate patents and intellectual property in a certain way or else. Uh, and then, of course, the investor state uh, issues and, and so on. I actually think, and I'm not just making a, a sort of a political point here, I actually think we should stop calling them free trade agreements because many of their provisions are exactly opposite to what you would think in a common sense way was about free, freeness, freedom. And uh, at any rate, the part that is about trade in that traditional sense is quite small. I actually think a, a non-pejorative, more accurate term for them would be international business agreements. The purpose of these deals is to allow companies to do more business internationally, buying and selling their products, uh, buying and selling services, placing investments in different countries, and having certainty and security and power when they do that. Um, and I actually think that's a more accurate term for, for, for what it is. And of course, facilitating capital mobility is part of the plan. Uh, it's part of allowing those businesses to make the most of opportunities in, in other countries, and so you get these extraordinary uh, protections and, uh, and provisions. So you ask about the, the person in England who was making port. Now, I'm not sure there ever was a port industry <laughs> in England, and if there was, I'm not sure I wanted to have drunk its product. 
Um, but um, the concept is an important one because that person, even if you accept the, you know, the vision that England as a whole will be better off, that person is probably going to experience some considerable disruption. And in theory, they should immediately find a job in an industry that's more productive um, in textiles. But in practice, it never happens that way. There are uh, costs of transition. And as I mentioned in my, in my list, those transition costs can be significant and, and long-lasting. Would the problem be solved by allowing that person to move to Portugal, in a way? Is that what you were thinking? Like, follow the work and go to Portugal. I think that the, the freedom of movement of people is an important aspect of it, and, and it is, you know, one of the things that's, in a way, most lamentable about the Brexit thing, is all those people who were looking forward to working and living in another country, uh, you know, have lost that or would lose that, you know, and I've, I've done that. I've worked and lived in other countries. I'm doing it right now, and it is something that's important. And that's what I would consider the ideal of globalization to be, of uh, interacting with the rest of the world. I do not think, though, that freeing labor would somehow put us on an even plane with capital, which has also been freed, okay? There's some people who make the argument that globalization would be fair, but only if you let workers follow the jobs instead of capital put their money wherever. The reality is in our system, it is the investor who decides where the work is going to be. So in a way, free labor mobility gives the investor more power to do that because they can put even more of their investment in that country before they encounter any kind of labor supply constraint on what they're doing. And if investment mobility was motivated, as it sometimes is, by regressive or even repressive social and human rights and environmental rules, then the fact that people could be allowed to follow the investment to those places would um, actually make matters worse in a way, not necessarily better, at least from a systemic perspective. A good example of this would be the United States, where within the union, of course, investment is free to go from one state to another. You have a difference on the labor law front between half of the country that is right to work laws, where unions are effectively prohibited, and half the country which has a, a, a system similar to Canada for its unions. And there has been a migration of investment over the last 30 years towards those right to work states. In America, of course, people can follow the jobs, and people have followed the jobs. So there has been a net migration from the north to the south in the United States, and not purely because of the climate. Uh, it is also because of the migration of work there. And, um, you know, from an individual's perspective, maybe it makes sense to do that. But um, it has reinforced, if you like, the power of investors to take advantage of the jurisdictional arrangements that are the most suited to, to companies. So, two good questions and two verbose answers. Anybody else? Please. Uh, my name is Rick King. My affiliation is just interested by standard. <clears throat> Thanks for coming. Um, one of your slides referenced. John Maynard Keynes, and you seem to support the idea that some type of international clearing union of trade deficits and surpluses might help balance the trade between countries. Um, since these deficits and surpluses are generated by private companies generally, how would such a system like that work uh, and you'd still be able to maintain some type of you know, capitalist freedom without excessive government intervention and telling investors and shareholders what to do with their hard-earned uh, gains from trade when, you know, if, if I sell lots of product to somebody, it forces me to behave in a certain way that I might not want to. Y you follow what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I'm difficult articulating the question, but it just seemed like in order for that sort of system to work would require an excessive amount of government intervention that may not be in the long run beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a really, a really good question and I obviously, um, I'd say, glossed over uh, some of the, the, all of the details of how a system like that could actually be designed and implemented to work. And as we've seen, as we've learned the hard way with the Euro, um, building these international institutions and, and, and building them in, in an effective and accountable and stabilizing way is very, very hard to do. Uh, CG, of course, has got some of the smartest minds in the world uh, working on that, uh, Dr. Heliner and, and others uh, looking at governance structures and how you build them. Um, 
I, I couldn't, uh, I think, add very much to the details of it. It certainly would require government intervention, though. That's clear. You'd have to have some kind of uh, rationing, uh, some kind of cap on the ability of uh, businesses in one country to um, export on a net basis without limit to consumers in other countries. And that is, the, that is the whole point. And you're right, those trade deficits that we see today are the result of success by individual companies in Germany or China or elsewhere in selling a huge volume of uh, output to other markets. In the Chinese case, a good chunk of those exports are coming from companies that aren't Chinese, right? They're coming from companies that have invested in China to take advantage of the very favorable investment climate uh, there. Um, so you could attack it either on a, um, a sort of industry by industry basis, you could attack it on a macroeconomic basis in terms of rationing access to the currency itself that is required to balance the international payments. That's where uh, Keynes was going at. Um, one example that we have, one experience we had in Canada with this was the Auto Pact, the Canada-US Auto Pact, which was implemented in 95 and then thrown out as a result of the WTO decision in uh, 2001, the auto pact was a system that within one industry put limits on the size of a surplus or deficit that could be encountered because it required the individual companies that were participating in this liberalized automotive trade between Canada and the United States, it required them, even within their own company, to maintain a certain balance of trade so that in the Canadian case they had to be producing roughly as much in Canada as they were selling here. That is equivalent to a kind of uh, um, a limitation on trade imbalances, and that's why the WTO threw the thing out. So it would require a, quite a change in mindset for sure, um, but uh, I think the current system, which says industries and companies and entire countries can run up as much surplus as they can to support their own successful activity at home with no accountability to the countries where they're selling that product, I don't think is uh, is sustainable in the long run. Um, I'm going to go to uh, another question online, and then I'll come to my friend at the mic. You mentioned lengthening patent protection. What is your feeling about copyright length? Should protection over cultural materials be globally or nationally regulated? Wow, now that's a very that's a very thoughtful question. I have to confess I haven't thought a lot about uh, cultural protections and cultural uh, patents. Patents. I tend to think. Uh, that the national approach makes sense because you're going to have reasons why you want to um, promote national culture or even subnational culture because of the particular identities um, and uh, histories and so on uh, that you have. Now, I understand with you know digital media and, and so on, some of those things are just inherently going to become more global in, in nature, but I would like to see us uh, continue to protect or even expand our ability to support uh, Canadian cultural production. Same would go for information and media uh, production. That would be my view. Uh, but I'll confess, I'm not an expert on that. I'll go to the um, the next mic, please. Good evening. Very, very nice to be here. My name is James Van Slyke, and I'm retired. My question comes from a uh, lecture I heard in Montreal at McGill about, oh, 1970. And the professor was mentioning that what we're really doing in North America is issuing IOUs and importing a standard of living from countries that are less developed, have lower wages and that type of thing. So it was not a trade agreement, it was more or less free trade, but it was working in our, uh, against us. I'm thinking of China, how we've built up these big deficits. And in Canada, we get the US dollars and that's the IOU we issue and we get the, the goods coming back. What would your comment be with respect to that? Mm -hmm. Well, in essence, if you're running a trade deficit, or more strictly speaking, a, an accounts deficit, a current accounts deficit, so just so you know, a current accounts deficit is your trade deficit in goods and services. It includes how much tourism uh, is adding or subtracting from your economy. That would be the balance of what Canadians spend when we go abroad versus what um, uh, foreigners spend when they come to Canada. And then also uh, investment income. Add up all of those flows on current income that's generated is more coming into the country than leaving it. The only way you can have a situation where you have a deficit, that is more money leaving than coming in, is if you are accumulating IOUs to the rest of the world. So in one way or another, uh, a trade deficit is reflected in an, an accumulation of debt uh, internationally. 
and that has been a big feature of uh, Canada's experience uh, over the last uh, eight years or so. Um, sooner or later, you have to, you have to, you know, if not pay it back, you have to reduce the burden of that international debt uh, relative to your economy. And um, without an international governance system that promotes a more balanced adjustment, the only way for you to do that is to forcibly stop buying stuff from the rest of the world. And that usually is uh, the type of thing that occurs in a balance of payments crisis or a collapse in the value of your currency or uh, a deep, deep recession that restores balance by uh, reducing um, domestic demand. This is part of the story of what happened in the United States in 2008, 2009. Uh, you had several years where the Americans were running up a huge current account deficit financed by IOUs from the rest of the world, and eventually um, that was not sustainable. So that wasn't the only reason, but it was clearly a contributing factor uh, to the decline. And, and again, in reference to the very first question that we looked at, uh, it is something we should be concerned about uh, in, in Canada with uh, growing international indebtedness. Next question. Uh, Stephen Fisher, I'm a, a teacher from Stratford, Ontario. Um, uh, surely someone's going to ask you about the TPP sooner or later, so, so I won't. Oh. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> hey, I think that's I, cheating. I, I, I will ask, though, um, we have a new prime minister. He's young. He, he's idealistic. He wears white jeans. Uh, and he wears white jeans. And I'm wondering, you, you move in circles where you would know people who know him. You may even have met him yourself. What, what, what is I may have even had a selfie with him. Uh, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe. I, I'm wondering your, your early impressions. What do you think he knows about economics and trade? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I, am, I, I don't know exactly what he knows about economics, but I'm pretty sure his political success has not much to do with what he knows about economics, but what he knows about uh, emotions and symbolism and connecting with people. He's done that uh, very effectively. And, you know, some of the things that this new government has done are, uh, I think, very uh, open-minded and uh, very encouraging. They have helped to change the mindset about fiscal austerity, uh, clearly, by, first of all, making it a pledge to run a deficit during the election. When's the last time that happened? but then uh, explaining effectively why that made sense. And, and they're, they're absolutely right. If anything, the deficit should be bigger than they are because we need more uh, public investment uh, and so on. Um, so on, the, on this issue of trade, trade governance and, and so on, it's hard to read where this government is at. You know, they make a big point of boasting that they believe in free trade and they kind of throw that out uh, uncritically. Uh, this government is working hard to try to salvage what they can of the CETA with Europe, um, that may be a losing battle for them, given what's happened with the Brexit and, and, and everything else. Uh, this government has been cautious in their verbiage about the TPP, uh, saying it was the previous government that signed it. Now they want to look at it carefully and decide what to do. I, I have a suspicion that might just be stalling. And if I were to make a prediction, unless they were pushed hard by public opinion, they would probably in the end come down in favor of um, going ahead with the TPP, although I'm increasingly convinced that's a moot point, uh, given what's happened in the United States and, and elsewhere. Uh, I think the prospects for the TPP going much further are, uh, are fairly dim, and, and I would say that's a good thing, uh, because the TPP is very much on the NAFTA cookie-cutter model of uh, what trade liberalization uh, should be. Um, so it's a, it's a, I'd say it's a, a moment of... Um, uh, interesting contestability for this government in terms of their vision on uh, trade policy and what to do about it. Anyone else? I think there's a, a question over here, please. Hi, uh, my name is Lorenzo Janito from the University of Warwick, UK. Oh. Um, thanks a lot for the talk, I really enjoyed that. Um, I was mainly wondering what, um, how did you view the, uh, the role played by the strategies of deindustrialization and financialization from the 70s onwards? or in other words, structural imbalances and trade agreements were not just signed or did not just happen into a political void uh, over those years. So I wonder um, what role, like how do, you, how do you see the role of those strategies in having fostered uh, those imbalances in the first place and how can we move forward from that? I mean, now the economy has become 
extremely polarized um, in, in terms of production and, mm -hmm. and import and, and, and credit. So how do we, how can we move on to a more balanced scenario given the extreme polarization of the economy mm -hmm. uh, at the current status? Wow. Thank you. You said deindustrialization and financialization. And financialization. Okay. Thanks. Uh, well, um, that's a good point of sort of historical and political context for where this particular vision of trade liberalization came from. You know, it didn't just fall from the sky. Um, it was individual people with certain views on things and certain interests in things that negotiated this vision of international corporate uh, governance. And the financial sector, which has a lot of capacity to um, take advantage of opportunities in international lending and international banking and currency flows and as the other uh, uh, questioner mentioned, tax havens and shifting their affairs around in order to minimize their tax liabilities and so on, um, were certainly a part of the political equation that allowed those types of agreements uh, to come together. So um, deindustrialization in the traditional industrial areas of the North is a consequence of the, I'd say, un uncritical or rose-colored approach to trade policy that we've seen and um, it created both the polarization that you're talking about but also the the political turmoil today that is uh, that's being expressed in in the brexit and, and trump and so on my only regret as a lefty <laughs> is that that turmoil and that uh, anger isn't coming out in what i would say it would be more constructive direction uh, which would be for a vision of, uh, uh, of um, an international economy, not an isolationist economy, an international economy that had um, job creation and balanced growth and mutuality at the center of it, rather than putting up walls. Uh, although I understand that we are gonna put up a wall if Trump wins, is that, is that the plan? <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you for that question. Um, one over here. Hi. Hello. Dan Schumacher, um, Concerned Citizen. Um, I'm thinking about the 33 million um, policymakers who make their own trade agreements, uh, typically with regards to luxuries, and the responsibility that we have to our fellow citizens and our planet. But that is a statement. So the 33 million is the is Canadians, you mean? Yes. Yes. Okay, I get you. Yeah. But the th I guess, the, having said that, the question I want to ask is, um, uh, how would your di uh, presentation be different if every statement about the economy was prefaced or followed up by a, a complimentary statement about our ecology? Well, the first thing I can assure you is that the presentation would have been twice as long. <laughs> Uh, but um, your, your point is uh, quite right that in every economic debate we have and every, certainly every economic policy um, direction that we head in, we, we have to be thinking about the environment and uh, the, obvious, the increasingly binding constraints that we face. Um, I think, uh, as I hinted, that the, what I'd see as a perverse specialization in resource extraction and export Canada has followed in part because of the laissez-faire approach to globalization that we've accepted has been uh, damaging environmentally. It is one of the reasons that our greenhouse gas emissions uh, have risen, you know, uh, as much as they have and, and are high uh, per capita relative to other countries. Now, uh, there's other ways in which this globalization can be harmful to the environment. Um, one of them is about the issue of transportation. The joke was made earlier about the shipbuilder being the one who truly benefited. Well, there is an awful lot of back and forth, physical back and forth that goes on as a result of these so-called global supply chains. And uh, the expansion, over-expansion, as it turns out, of the global shipping industry, which is a pollution haven, because there's no national authority that regulates pollution from the, the um, uh, shipping lines and so on. And it is, if you took uh, the shipping industry and treated it as a country, uh, it would be the sixth or seventh largest single emitter of greenhouse gas, uh, uh, gas pollution on the planet, which is astounding when you think about it. So that's, a, that's another dimension 
uh, to the problem. I'm not saying that globalization is the cause of environmental destruction. I think whether you're thinking globally or nationally, we have to be integrating ecological concerns and sustainability into every, every decision that we make. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have one on this side? Yeah, I'm gonna be fair here. I'm gonna go left, right, left, right. And by the way, Rohan, you said I'm the one on the extreme left of the bottom line panel. That depends on which side of the TV you're looking at, okay? I, I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Hi, uh, my name's Sebastian. I'm a student here at the Balsillie School. Um, my question is, in your opinion, uh, is our commitment to trade liberalization um, a, a product of, a, of an earnest belief that it's in the national interest, or is it a product of the state's longstanding tendency to reflect the interests of capital? Um, and if it's the latter, uh, what recourse does the public have to reverse or, or arrest the, the trend of liberalization? Wow. Uh, that's a great question. Um, well, the trade liberalization, as we've experienced, is certainly promoted as something that will benefit the whole national interest, but um, it is formulated and conceived and implemented in a political context, and it is a political context in which very powerful um, business forces are very much in favor of this uh, idea. And I always find it amazing that people identify the national interest with the interest of national companies. You know, we, and we've seen that in the TPP debate, for example, because some of the auto companies were concerned about what the TPP would do for the auto industry. There was two particular Canadian auto parts companies whose leaders, who happened to be connected to the Conservative Party, but whose leaders came out and publicly said, this will benefit my company by virtue of giving me the ability to invest in these places in Asia and elsewhere, and um, we should do it. Uh, for that reason. But of course, what's good for a company is not necessarily good for the country. I think we've uh, learned that. And my concern is not so much on the nationality of the company as on whether all the companies, Canadian-owned or foreign-owned, are doing enough business in Canada to, to support the jobs and investment and exports uh, that we need. So you're quite right to do a bit of a power analysis of where do these ideas come from and who's really pushing them. And because I call them international business agreements rather than free trade agreements, uh, the strongest core of support for them, not the only core of support, but the strongest core of support comes from, um, from business interests. There's no doubt about it. So you're quite right. Maybe are we on our last question over here on the right side? Or we got a couple more? Okay, very good. Please. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Anna. I graduated from London School of Economics with a master's degree in local economic development and uh, moved to Canada and Waterloo recently. So my, ca my question came from the Canadian Prime Minister's visit in China for the G20 very recently. He met one of the most successful businessmen in China and agreed to um, sell Canadian products to Chinese customers. And interestingly, I read a news in CG website. Someone was questioning about something bad or illegal could be happen during the processing and the dispatching process. So finally, the customer may receive the fake products. So I'm, curi I'm curious to know if policymaker in economic sector pay full attention or clo work closely with the legal team about who will take the responsibility of monitoring and regulating the trade process, especially considering different countries have different legal system and different institutional arrangements. Thank <coughs> you very much. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, there is a lot of attention in trade agreements to the issues of copyright, product uh, authenticity, brand protection, and so on. And uh, some of the trade agreements have got, I think, increasingly far-reaching and in, in some ways intrusive rules um, whereby uh, a country has to take responsibility for uh, enforcing these things. Um, now, the situation in China, of course, is, is probably pretty fluid. Uh, in that regard, there's a lot of counterfeiting uh, that goes on in China, but it goes on in a lot of places around the world. And so part of the general emphasis on protecting intellectual property, whether it's drug patents or uh, information technology or cultural products, 
or even brand names in essence. That's what that is. It's a, a concern about protecting the value of the brand against others who try to capitalize on the on the saleability that comes from that brand uh, is part of this whole dimension of free trade agreements that is much more than trade. It is about protecting business, protecting property rights in, in a certain way. And again, we could have a discussion on every one of these topics about what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. But I think what's indisputable is that we can't call it a free trade agreement when so much of it is about limiting and regulating uh, and enforcing things, not about freeing them. Okay. Last question, thank you. Hello, Jim. Uh, I'm Sam. Nice to meet you Hi, in Sam. person. I've been following you uh, with uh, Steve Bacon for years. So thank you. Uh, it's a new continuation of uh, previous question. So is this uh, liberalization uh, system reversible somehow? Let's say if you tomorrow uh, prime minister or something. So. What would you do, like practically, to save your uniform uh, brothers? Uh, well, is there concrete steps to do something? Sam, could you just come up here for a sec? Just come over here, because your question is very good. Yeah, just come up here up on the stage. Okay. Just come up on the stage. Thank you. Okay. So you're saying if I was prime minister tomorrow, what would I do? Hashtag duh. <laughs> of course, I'd get some good selfies in there. Uh, actually, uh, joking aside, your question is in a way the most important one because uh, um, I actually um, I'm not sure exactly how you would reverse it. And the way the Brexit came about, I think, has highlighted people's sensitivity to the fact that you know sometimes when you you know, when you break a glass, you can't put it back together in a way, right? That how we're going to reform and change and improve this situation may not just be trying to reverse what happened. Because, uh, of course, there are supply chains that have evolved over time and that reflect the context of that laissez-faire liberalization. So, you know, what would you do? You know, if, if, uh, if an alternative approach came to be reflected in a government, would you just rip up the free trade agreements? I don't think that you would. I don't think that would in and of itself accomplish what you want to accomplish and you'd then you'd encounter some uh, collateral damage because of the disruption and the uncertainty that that caused. I think what you'd have to do is go in with a strategy to uh, reform and change these things, to address the imbalances that have emerged, to limit trade deficits and to limit um, lopsided flows of capital um, in order to make sure that you're getting a fair share of the business in the in the integrated area so you know an example of this would be um, the union that I worked for Unifor uh, had uh, proposed the idea of a North American auto pact um, in order to address this persistent trade deficits that uh, were being experienced in the auto industry with Mexico and other uh, other places and you know this was a, a a vision that wasn't just about ripping something up, but saying we have to m we have to shift the pattern of trade and investment in this direction uh, in order to um, attain something that's more balanced. Um, I don't have the full answer to how we reverse it. Uh, I think it won't be just trying to go back to what it was before. Uh, I think it will have to be trying to modify what's there now, motivated by principles that trade, not free trade, but trade, and even foreign investment can be beneficial um, as long as you're doing it in a way where uh, you have the capacity to manage those flows and processes to protect the public interest um, in, in all participants of it because it doesn't happen automatically. That would be the takeaway uh, from, my, from my talk tonight. Free trade will never automatically ensure that everyone benefits in the way that economic theory says uh, they will and the politics of globalization are unsustainable given the pain and dislocation and suffering that has been caused. Uh, so if we want to preserve a world that, that works together and that exchanges and trades with each other, 
uh, we have to get in uh, with a hands-on approach to make sure that it's a world that's uh, more fair and balanced than the one that we're in today. So with that, thank you very, very much for your <laughs> questions and your attention. Those were marvelous, marvelous questions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Jim. So, um, I just want to share a couple of takeaways from uh, the very refreshing lecture that uh, Jim Stanford has given tonight at CG. Uh, the first is that, uh, you know, being in favor of trade, being in favor of uh, an open world economy, doesn't mean to unequivocally and uncritically accept uh, the free trade paradigm. And actually, uh, the rising uh, anti-globalization feelings embodied by uh, those politicians that uh, Jim was referring to, Le Pen in France, Farage in the UK, uh, Trump in the United States, and many more around the world that maybe we don't know yet, are nurtured by those, uh, especially PhD economists, who, uh, who tend to portray international trade uh, and globalization as a one-way bet, a one-way street, um, where essentially everybody uh, benefits from without actually recognizing the limits and the trade-offs as a basis for having you know, a more balanced discussion about uh, also mitigating measures, um, as Jim has, um, I think, very clearly pointed out. And uh, I, would, uh, I would also add that it's difficult to talk about trade when the economy does well, when the world economy grows at a decent rate. It's even more difficult to talk about trade uh, when uh, the, go the global economy doesn't do too well. And actually, as uh, Madame Lagarde, the head of the IMF, has uh, reminded us at Wanzhou in China just a few days ago, this is gonna be the fifth consecutive year in which the world economy is growing below potential, below capacity. And most likely next year is going to be the sixth consecutive year in which, uh, again, the world economy will be growing below capacity. And uh, the interaction of uh, a protracted low growth on the one end and the increasing inequality on the other is really creating in many uh, societies, in many economies, uh, an adverse and even more adversarial uh, attitude towards globalization and, uh, and international trade that we must take note of. Um, so uh, before, before we adjourn this uh, lecture, there's uh, some uh, housekeeping that uh, I'd like to uh, draw your attention on. Uh, first, uh, uh, an edited video of uh, today's lecture will be posted on um, the CG website within 40 f 48 hours. Um, so that if you like to share, you know, the video with your friends within your network, if you like uh, to know, to tweet about it, you can do uh, you can do so easily. And also, be sure to sign up for our newsletter uh, or check our website for upcoming public events. And in particular, I want to draw your attention on three forthcoming events. So the first is on Wednesday, September the 14th, um, and uh, uh, Stephanie McLellan, a research associate, CG will be introducing the documentary um, Deep Web, uh, a documentary that explores the rise of a new internet, decentralized, encrypted, uh, dangerous, and beyond the law. Uh, and then on uh, Monday, September the 19th, <coughs> CG Senior Fellow Besma Mumani will be giving um, a talk on uh, building communities to resilience as the best form of defense on uh, de-radicalization and uh, how to integrate radicals. And finally, on Thursday, October the 6th, um, UW, the University of Waterloo, uh, the Basili School and CG present uh, The World is Watching, Foreign Policy and the US Presidential Election. And we'll be having uh, as a guest speaker, uh, Ambassador Derek Shearer. Uh, he's a former uh, US ambassador to Finland. So be sure to register online at uh, cgonline.org for the CG events newsletter and uh, to receive information on uh, all our upcoming events. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening and uh, have a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.
was him chewing a raw onion. I don't know if any of you uh, saw that up here. And uh, of course, Mr. Harper had a few of his own, but they both, uh, both departed. They've both been replaced by, uh, by new, uh, new crime ministers. And it's a, an exciting time to be in Australia, helping to share some of the lessons that we learned uh, in Canada. Uh, Rohan, you care, very generously mentioned uh, the book that's for sale outside. I always hasten to add, I don't get a cent from the sales of these books. I did something that uh, is a crime against nature, according to neoclassical economics. I did something for love, not for money. And uh, all of the proceeds uh, from the book go to the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, which is our progressive think tank in Canada. And uh, there's a website that actually has a whole bunch of free materials. I know there's some teachers in the room, a whole bunch of uh, lecture notes and other student exercises, pedagogical materials for teaching economics, including a couple of chapters on international economics uh, from uh, a more critical perspective. And please help yourself from those materials uh, at the website, open source. And then uh, finally, there's my Twitter handle, Jimbo Stanford. So if uh, anyone's uh, on Twitter tonight, feel free to uh, let loose. And uh, we'll stay in touch that way, uh, even when I'm down in, uh, in Straya, when I'm back in Straya, I've learned actually, if I want to tweet to my Canadian followers, I have to do it in the middle of the night in Australia, which is regular time here. And if I want to tweet to my Australian followers, I tweet in the day there, which is the middle of the night here. So that's, uh, that's kind of handy uh, that way. So finally, uh, this is a, a sort of more formal reference for some of the material that I'm going to be covering tonight. This is a chapter that was in a book published recently by the Institute for Research on Public Policy in Montreal. Uh, about trade challenges uh, facing Canada, and some of the material that I'll be covering tonight comes from that source. If anybody wants to uh, get proper proper about it and check out the citations and, and, and all that kind of stuff, uh, please do. That's available, the whole book's available on their website uh, for free. So, we're in a time of uh, actually an unprecedented backlash against the traditional precepts of uh, globalization. So, uh, we've seen it all over uh, the world, of course. We've seen it with uh, Mr. Farage and the uh, Brexit uh, phenomena in Britain, uh, the rise of uh, kind of xenophobic, uh, very right-wing anti-globalization politic politicians like uh, Ms. Le Pen in uh, France, and uh, of course, closer to home, we have, God help us, uh, President-designate uh, tr Mr. Trump, uh, see what happens there. But uh, it is amazing how the politics of the discussions of free trade have changed in the last few years, uh, and, and there is something behind it. Uh, you obviously have politicians who are incredibly clever and effective at taking advantage of uh, a public mood, but they wouldn't be successful if there wasn't a public mood for them to take advantage of and to misdirect in, in what I believe are uh, very destructive, dangerous, xenophobic, uh, and, and, and potentially um, catastrophic uh, directions. Um, but I don't think the response to this backlash is to pretend that the problem doesn't exist or that people are somehow misguided into thinking that uh, globalization is bad when in fact anyone... For those of you watching on the web, and we will then wind up with a few words from my colleague who heads CG's uh, economics program, Dominica Lombardi. So thank you again, and Jim, welcome to CG. All right, thank you so much, uh, Rowanton. Thanks, uh, all of you, for coming out on such a glorious late summer evening to listen to an economist. They say an economist is someone who's good with numbers and didn't have the personality to become an accountant. <laughs> so, with that forewarning, if any of you want to leave and go to the patio across the street and uh, have a drink, I won't be at all uh, offended. But uh, I'm really excited uh, to come to CG for the first time, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a fabulous building, a wonderful uh, theater, and a tremendous uh, group of people who are really helping to uh, stir the pot uh, in the policy world, including uh, on international economic policy, which is what we're talking about uh, tonight. So I'm very grateful for the invitation uh, to join you, and thank you. Uh, for coming along uh, tonight. I have, of course, uh, traveled to, uh, to Canada, or as the uh, recently departed Prime Minister of Australia called it, Canadia. <laughs> that was uh, Mr. Uh, Tony Abbott uh, who, who said that on his last visit. Uh, all the way from uh, Straya, as uh, I'm learning to pronounce the vernacular uh, down there. And it's an exciting challenge uh, for me to be based in uh, Sydney and learn about uh, Australian issues. And, Often they're shockingly uh, similar. Uh, in fact, uh, Rohanton uh, mentioned uh, uh, Harold Innes, the, the famous Canadian economic historian who my position at McMaster is named after. And there should be a, a Australian Harold Innes. Uh, 
uh, because they have exactly uh, the same history and the same trajectory and then both the, the benefits and the, and the downsides of uh, the resource dependence and the boom times while they last, but uh, we've been around that block a couple times in Canada and the boom times don't always last. Uh, I grew up in Alberta, uh, of course, to, in an oil family and I do remember the bumper sticker uh, in, uh, in Calgary in about, I don't know, 1986, I think said, please God, let there be another oil boom, and I promise not to piss it all away this time, you know? And uh, I think that bumper sticker just replaced oil with coal uh, or iron ore, and that bumper sticker would be a popular uh, seller in, uh, in Australia. Um, another thing, of course, uh, that the two countries have in common was these two guys. There's uh, Mr. Abbott and uh, Mr. Harper. They were a uh, tag team for years. At, I think this was actually at a G20 meeting, if I'm not mistaken. This photo uh, where they... Was it a G20 meeting? You guys are the G20 experts. There was a meeting in India. What? It had to be. Oh, oh, it was APEC. Okay, yeah, there you go. Yeah, with shirts like that, you're right. Uh, anyways, uh, <laughs> the, it's better than the, the respective pictures they had separately, of course. The, the famous one of Mr. Adam, who's taken Economics 101 at college, knows that globalization is perfect, good, and mutually beneficial all of the time. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that does seem to be kind of the official response of the nabobs, if you like, in charge of the global economy uh, to this moment of challenge and danger, is to say, well, we must redouble our efforts, friends, uh, to illustrate and illuminate those uh, misguided uh, people out there as to why uh, free trade is actually uh, good for them, not bad for them. Uh, so a couple of examples of that response, a commentary published by a senior official at the World Bank recently um, to the effect of uh, isolationism and protectionism would break the trade-based economic engine that has delivered peace and prosperity to the world for decades. You know, uh, I mean, so all of those people who voted for the Brexit in uh, Rust Belt Britain and all the people who are voting for Trump in Rust Belt and other impoverished parts of America just haven't figured out that they're enjoying an unprecedented period of peace and uh, prosperity. Uh, so that, that kind of I know better than you what's good for you attitude is uh, obviously as offensive as it is ineffective. Uh, Christine Lagarde on the close of the G20 meeting the other day in China uh, said something similar and we need to better identify the benefits of trade in order to respond to the easy populist backlash uh, against uh, globalization. So there isn't uh, any uh, rationale, there isn't any logic behind that backlash, it's, it's just uh, misguided somehow. Interesting, uh, as she made that statement, she used the experience of China as the case study in the benefits of globalization and free trade, uh, which was astounding uh, to me. She is an economist and she should know full well that the incredible things that have happened in China, including uh, the reduction of poverty for hundreds of millions of people, it is incredible, it has nothing to do with free trade. Uh, whatever the uh, successes uh, of that regime are, and there's a downside to it as well, but I recognize the successes. Uh, it's all about uh, planning and state regulation and intervention, uh, not about uh, free trade at all. Uh, so uh, even in their own intellectual framework, um, the, the hypocrisy is, uh, is astounding. Uh, the promise of globalization uh, has, uh, has always been extraordinary. Uh, if you liberalize international commerce, then you'll promote more trade, and the goal of more trade is somehow seen as good in and of itself. You don't have to go further than that. If you say something promotes trade, then it must be good. Um, it will force countries or encourage countries to specialize in producing the things that they do best, um, the uh, whole idea of comparative uh, advantage. Total output of the world economy will grow because people will be more productive because they're doing what they do best. There'll be no impact on employment, uh, at least uh, other than any kind of short-run adjustment effects. The uh, total level of employment will remain uh, constant. Consumers will benefit because they'll have more choice and cheaper products. Uh, and you'll get gains from this whole process that will be shared uh, by all participants. This is the promise of the uh, uh, standard. Welcome to CG. Uh, before I 
get to the main act, as it were. Speaking of Welcome to CG, uh, many of you who came in might have seen the buzz uh, in our old building, the old Seagram building next door, and that's because tonight is when Shopify officially moves into that building and they're having their housewarming party. And I simply wanted to sort of welcome them to, to, the, to the largest of uh, community life and campus life here. Looking forward to having them as our friends and neighbors and very much looking forward to uh, the, the very many things that, that, that they will bring to us and stay tuned uh, for that one as well. Now, um, given what Jim Stanford does and stands for, I found it quite surprising when we met earlier today that he hasn't been here before, that it took us this long to connect and bring him. But Jim, welcome uh, to, uh, to CG. Um, Jim, in many ways, doesn't need an introduction to many of you because we know him as the voice of the labor economist, as it were, as he, as he was often portrayed on, uh, on television and in the media. And in fact, Jim is one of Canada's best known economic commentators. Uh, he served for many years as the economist and director of policy for UNIFOR, which is Canada's largest private sector union, formerly known as the Canadian Auto Workers Union. He still advises the union, but now calls uh, Australia and uh, Hamilton, Ont Sydney, Australia, and Hamilton, Ontario home. At McMaster, he is the Harold Innes Industry Professor in Economics at Mac, uh, and he still writes regular columns, as you all would know, for the Globe and Mail, and is a founding member of CBC Television's Bottom Line Economics Panel. He's the one to the far left on the panel. Um, given his background, I guess the topic of his talk, uh, Beggar Thy Neighbor, Hurdles of International Trade Governance should come as no surprise. And perhaps Jim will even give, a, give us a bit of a lesson in uh, the great work of Harold Innes. I should also say that there's a second edition out. Uh, the first one came out about eight years ago, I'm guessing, Jim, of his book, Economics for Everyone. A Short Guide to the Economics of Capitalism. There's a second edition out, and there will be copies for sale and signature, uh, and perhaps even a photograph at the end of this uh, lecture. So for those of you interested, by all means, join us for that as well. Um, the format is the usual one. Jim will speak with us. He will take his own questions from you in the audience. And your model of international free trade that's been posited uh, for uh, uh, over two centuries uh, now. In reality, um, the expectation is different. This would be the theme song for the, uh, the traditional view. Everyone's a winner. Everyone's a winner, baby, that's the truth. <laughs> Disco revival, white jeans, look at, look at that, eh? Our prime minister is wearing jeans like these these days, I'm told. Uh, there was even a photo of it in the, uh, uh, in the Australian papers uh, of him in his white jeans, go figure. Um, so, uh, you know, this idea that everyone can win and no one will lose uh, is actually very deeply embedded uh, in traditional uh, theory. In reality, of course, uh, it has been quite different. And in Canada's experience, um, we've seen some perverse outcomes. We have seen, in, as globalization was intensified, we've actually seen a shift in our production activity towards non-tradable industries those uh, t uh, generally smaller scale, lower income, lower productivity, non-tradable service activities, uh, which um, have nothing to do with globalization. In fact, it's because they were insulated from globalization that they were able to survive and grow uh, while other industries uh, contracted. Uh, so that's uh, perverse. We've seen a shift in our resources toward lower productivity growth sectors, including those non-tradables, but even in the tradables uh, area, you've seen an emphasis uh, on non-renewable resource extraction where productivity is falling over time. That's the whole idea of a non-renewable resource. You go after the low-hanging fruit first, you tap the reserves that are most economical to uh, tap, and then the harder stuff takes more time to produce. If you're going to get oil by putting a hole in the ground and watching it all flow out, uh, that's easy. If you have to get oil by digging out mountains of sand and processing it through incredibly expensive refineries, that's hard. And productivity in the energy sector and other non-renewable extractive sectors falls over time. And that's where we've been putting more of our resources uh, to the extent that we're specializing in tradables at all. We've seen a profound deindustrialization uh, in Canada. 
a decline in manufacturing that is not typical of uh, advanced countries. There are reasons why you might see an erosion of manufacturing as a share of GDP over time in an advanced country as you shift towards uh, services industries, but you shouldn't see an outright decline of the scale that we've experienced in Canada. Um, we've seen consistent large trade deficits and the mounting of international debt uh, that is clearly associated with reductions in our GDP and employment levels. The fact that billions, tens of billions of dollars uh, are leaving the country through those trade deficits, uh, not being spent on Canadian made products has contributed to the uh, weakness of Canada's macroeconomic uh, performance over the last few years and our labour market uh, performance. Uh, and you've seen the financial uh, instability dimension of it uh, in terms of exchange rates that shoot up and, and collapse uh, and the uh, trickle-through uh, impacts of um, all of the uncertainty.